Welcome to The Crossing, so glad you're here. If this is your first time joining with us, we are so honored to have you here today. Make sure to say something in the chat, we would love to get to know you better. If you're joining in and you attend one of our physical locations, we're sorry that you couldn't make it this week, but we're glad that we can keep you connected while you're away. Here online, we seek to connect people to an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ in any way possible. No matter where you're watching from, we consider you a part of the crossing. If you need prayer for anything during service, hit the prayer button at the bottom of the screen and you and I can pray together. If you'd like to take ownership in this service in your church, hit the give button at the top of the page. We are in week two of our series, Wreck the Roof, and we are loving it. If you just joined in or if you missed, you can check out our website, thewreaktheroof.org to get caught up. Together as we gather around all of our devices across the entire world, let's spend some time in worship before we end the sermon. You are my shepherd guiding me. You give me everything I need. Oh, I know that you love me. You lay me down in pastures green. You lead me by the quiet streams. Oh, I know that you love me. Jesus, you are good and your love.
Well, good morning, Crossing Church. How are you doing this morning? You doing all right? It is so good to see you. I want to welcome all of you that are joining from this entire region, from all of our locations all over this region. We're so thankful for you. I just pray that God has given you an incredible, incredible day today, and uh, this will just set you off for the whole week. God will do great things through you this week. If you're joining inside, online, or .tv, we are so thankful that you're joining with us as well. And we have the opportunity to be one family, one body in Christ, ministering to uh, all of the uh, opportunities and the divine appointments that God has put around us. And uh, all of our locations, I uh, want you to know that the uh, new CD is out and it's in your lobbies and you can pick it up. It's called This Is Life. And it is, in, you know, you uh, heard one of the songs just a little while ago off this album. And it's just absolutely incredible. So buy one, two, or 5,000 of these. And uh, that really supports uh, what our worship ministry is doing and how they're exploring new ways to give God glory. So be aware of that. And uh, uh, you, you know that last week we started this new spiritual journey together. It's a six-week journey, and it's going to actually push out into two uh, years. And so there's five more weeks in this series, and I don't want you to miss any week. I want you to be here for every single week of it. And if you missed last week, go to wrecktheroof.org, uh, all lowercase, wrecktheroof.org, and get on the archive, and you can watch uh, what you missed last week uh, so you can be right up to date with all of us, okay? We don't want you to miss a single week because I really believe with all my heart, this is going to be a life-changing, church-altering series, and uh, the impact that it's going to have is so far-reaching, we don't even begin to understand it. Uh, I hope you brought your booklet with you this week. This is something that we handed out last week. Uh, it was uh, a, a gift that we wanted to make for everyone uh, at all of our locations. And uh, if you haven't gotten one yet, I would like for you to raise your hand. We have, pe we have uh, people around that will make sure that you get one of these. They'll pass them down to you so that every single one of us can have uh, this together. So they're passing those out now. And uh, keep your hands raised and they'll get it to you. If you're joining with us online, go to wrecktheroof.org and there's a big blue button 
And uh, you hit that and it'll download this booklet uh, there for your tablet or your computer, uh, whatever you need. And uh, inside of here, what you're going to see are vision pages that spell out the things that we feel like God is calling us to do. There's message notes so you can follow along with each message over these six weeks and write down your own personal thoughts. And then there's life group uh, material in here as well. And if you're not in a life group, this is a great opportunity for you to try one out. And it's not too late to do that. Uh, So you can go to the hub in the lobby, all of our locations, and they'll get you connected into a life group. And who knows, you might build lifelong relationships through that life group. And that would just be awesome. If you're online, you can connect that way as well. There's actually life groups we're doing online. And I want you to be aware of that. Part of that, if you just received it for the first time, those that received it last week already know about this, uh, but there is a a Wreck the Roof commitment card that is connected to your booklet. We'll be dealing with this in a few weeks, but this is what I want you to do with it now. I want you to put it in a conspicuous place in your house. That's a, a place where there's a lot of traffic, but you'll be passing by it so that every time you see it, you can just be praying about that because that's what we're asking. 100% participation is everyone praying to God saying, what do you want me to do? Help me to follow what it is that you're saying to me. And uh, this is a great tool to help you accomplish that. Now, if you're a difference maker or if you're a leader in our church, uh, there is going to be this incredible experience we're going to have together on March the 2nd. It's called the Advanced Commitment Night. If you love nights of worship, I mean, it's gonna, we're going to pull all the stops out. It's going to be absolutely great, and you do not want to miss that. Look, if you're not a difference maker or a leader, this is a great opportunity to say, put me to work. How can I be a part? Help me to get involved because we'd love for you to be there as well. I really believe that uh, March the 2nd is going to be a spiritual marker moment for our church. And uh, if you're ready to lead out in a commitment, uh, then we want to welcome you to that uh, because we're going to be doing that ahead of time. You can RSVP to go to the, uh, to the Advanced Commitment Night on wrecktheroof.org. We need to know that. And uh, we'll have an awesome time together. Now, what I want you to do is turn to page 36 in your booklet because that's where we are uh, today. And uh, that's the, uh, the, the sermon and the scriptures that we're going to be utilizing. So let's just take a moment and pray together that God would prepare our hearts for this. Heavenly Father, I'm just so thankful for another week of being able to explore these roofs that were wrecked uh, in the New Testament uh, and how uh, your son Jesus was so instrumental in doing incredible things on the other side of it. And I pray that this wouldn't just be something that we read about that happened 2,000 years ago, but that you would just invade our space right now in this moment. And if there are roofs that need to come down, that need to be broken through, uh, Father, I pray that you would do that in each and every one of our hearts today in Jesus' name. Amen. Like I told you last week, we're going to explore five questions uh, with these different stories of roofs that were wrecked. And uh, the first of those Uh, questions is like, what was the roof? Before I do that, I want to ask you a question. Do you have a secret? Do you? Do you have a secret? Now I'm not talking about something that might be a little embarrassing or something that someone else told you in confidence. I'm talking about one of those secrets that if other people knew it about you, it could potentially wreck you or it could potentially wreck the relationship that you have with somebody that you care about. One of those secrets. You know what I think? I think we all have some of those. I really do. I think we have all have some skeletons in our closet. We all have some dirty laundry that we'd rather not air out. We all have some bodies buried in the backyard, if you know what I mean. And it might not just be consigned to the past. It might not just be something that you regret, that you wish you got a do-over on. It might be something that you're actually wrestling with right now, something that's in your life right now. Regardless of which one of those two it might be, 
I really want you to key in on what we learn from God's Word today. You know, we're, we're in the middle of a phenomenon that's happening in America right now called the Me Too movement. And what it's doing is it's exposing wrecked lives, people whose lives were wrecked because of abuse. And it's also exposing abusers, right? And, and careers are being blown up and it's ending uh, a, a lot of very well uh, placed lives and, you know, people who thought everything was protected and it really wasn't because our secrets can really make us ugly and they can make us unacceptable and it can affect both us on the inside and on the outside, right? It's true. The roof that we're wrecking today is one of those stories. That's what we're going to be talking about and it's, uh, it's in three of the Gospels, but we're going to read the one in the book of Mark, okay? So I want us to read that together, starting in Mark chapter 5. It says, so Jesus went with him, and a large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. This is female, this is minstrel, for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she learned about Jesus, she, well, heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him and he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see, the people crowding uh, against you, Jesus, uh, his disciples answered, and yet you ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. What an incredible story. So what was the roof? What was the roof? This woman had a secret. And that was her roof. It was the secret. So when you think about your secrets, the things that you may be holding back on, that might be your roof as well. Because this had literally wrecked her life. It wasn't just a physical problem, although it was a serious physical problem. It had literally affected every single part, every aspect of her life. Her wellness was gone, right? But her self-respect went along with it. It was gone. Just imagine what it would be like going to a doctor for this in the first century. Imagine what that would have been like. Would have been horrible, and they actually made her worse. Her money was gone. Her fertility was gone. Her family and her friends were gone. Her relationship with God was gone. You're going, wait a minute. It doesn't say her relationship with God was gone. Well, to understand her culture, you would understand that that's true. Because this type of bleeding made you ceremonially unclean. It meant that you, until, until that cycle was over, you could not go into the temple, you couldn't worship God, you couldn't pray to God, you couldn't do any of that stuff, right? And since this was a continual problem, it made her continually, ceremonially unclean. As a matter of fact, if she touched anybody else, it would make them unclean. And they would have to go to a priest, and they would have to say, this is what I've done, and then they would have to do whatever they needed to do to make them ceremonially unclean clean again. It was not just a roof in her life. It was the walls and the floor. It was her whole life. And she was compartmentalized by the secret. Now this was something you could hide from other people, right? They wouldn't necessarily see it, but it was true nonetheless. And Jewish culture at this time, they had no mercy for it. They considered something like this as God's judgment on you. And you know what? I think she probably did too. 
I bet she asked herself the question, what did I do? What did, what did I fail to do that brought this into my life? I wonder, as I'm telling that story, I wonder how many secrets that that's connecting to at all of our locations right now. There are circumstances and there are situations in your life that keep you from being who you were made to be, who you were called to be, who you should be, who God views you as being. But you can't move forward in that because the secret that you hold on to is too great to let out. You've tried everything, but the secret remains. And maybe you feel free of that, that reality personally, but I can guarantee you, if you're saying, hey, this doesn't apply to me right now, the people around you, in front of you, behind you, all of our locations, people that you know and love, all around you in your daily lives, I guarantee you that they're connecting with it. So what was wrecked or what was broken through? Because we know what the roof was. The roof was her secret. What was wrecked? Well, what was broken through? The immediate context of the story is a woman who can't get to Jesus because there's a crowd around Jesus, right? And this crowd is pressing in on Jesus. And so there's no way that she can really approach Jesus because of all this crowd. So I see the immediate barrier that needs to be wrecked as that crowd. Like, how do I get to Jesus? How do I circumvent this barrier? This is not like a literal roof like last week. It's a barrier. And, I, and that had to be coupled with this personal shame that she felt because she knew that if she touched him, she'd make him unclean. And her faith told her that everyone who touched Jesus was, could, could, could be healed, but she would render him unclean, right? as well. And she didn't want to make him unclean as well. She thought, if I could just touch his cloak, you know, in some scriptures it says the hem of his garment. Now, when it, when it talks about that, what is it specifically referring to? Like, what would a, a Jewish man be wearing that she would be referring to? Well, it was probably the tallit. And a tallit is a shawl that men wore around their uh, necks and shoulders. And when they prayed, they would pick the shawl up and they would cover their head with it. That was, that was called a tallit. And the tallit extended all the way down near the ground. And at the bottom of the tallit, there, were, there was a fringe, like a, a, a ceremonial fringe. And uh, the, the, these little fringes on the bottom were called tzitzit. And so what she was probably thinking was if I can just touch that bottom part of his, of his prayer cloak, of his prayer shawl, one of those little tzitzits, if I could do that, then, then I would be clean. But I want you to think about what it would take for her to touch those. She would have to circumvent this whole crowd. She would have to get down low because that's where that was, which means what? She'd have to crawl through a crowd. She would have to crawl through a crowd to get him. So the only word that I can use to describe this, 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 this picture I'm seeing is desperation. But desperation is a powerful thing, isn't it? Desperation has the power to break through a lot of barriers. Things that you would never consider in normal life. When you're desperate, you move into this other place. Desperation causes you to do some pretty important things. It's the place where we say, what else do I have to lose? I might as well try. And that's where she is. And it was in that desperation that you wreck whatever's left of your self-respect. Have you ever thought that maybe the reason that you don't feel as close to Jesus as you'd like to, or maybe as you were in the past is because you've allowed the barriers in your life to stay in place. Maybe the secrets or those things that need to be wrecked that you've never really pushed through them in desperation. So maybe we know what the roof was and maybe we know what was wrecked or broken through, but what was her moment of commitment? That actual moment of commitment. 
I see this woman being kicked because she's down low. I see her being tripped over. I see people cursing and swearing at her because she's down on her hands and knees on the ground and she's making it difficult for them to stay close to Jesus. And, and, and I see her extending her arm, her hand, just to try and reach him and pushing and reaching and reaching. And I can see Jesus, maybe because of the crowd, who knows why, I can see him slowing down, maybe even stopping in his walk for a moment. And in that moment where he slows down and stops, the distance is shortened between her hand and the hem of his garment, and she touches his garment. In that moment, and in an instant, there's this warm surge that goes through her body. And a once nearly forgotten memory of what it felt like to be well fills her body. Because the scripture says she knew instantly. She knew instantly. It just stopped and she was healed. It was like, it was like this incredible power comes out of Jesus and fills her body and completely heals her. Now, that was all she wanted. That was all that she really wanted from Jesus. But it was not all she needed. Hear that, okay? I want you to hear that today because sometimes we have this list, this is what I want, but we don't realize what we really need, right? And so what does she do? After she has that healing, she shrinks back into the crowd to disappear forever, right? So that nobody will see her anymore. Again, this was all she wanted and that was all she could do in that desperation to reach out for Jesus. But it's what happened to her next that was so wonderful. You know, because it was all she could do, but it was not all he could do. And it's amazing how sometimes we just want to settle for our felt needs, but we don't have any idea or any clue of what our real needs are. And there is someone that actually does know our real needs and ministers to us on a level that we don't even understand ourselves. You know, I told you last week about this commitment card and be praying over this commitment card. This is what I want you to do. I want you to consider that a commitment is not just about what you think is necessary. You know, a lot of times when we look at a thing like this and we're talking about like making a commitment, we're thinking about, well, well what can I do? What's best for me? How does it fit into my schedule and my world and my family? But you see what we're learning from this story is how it's not about what she considers is important. It's about what he considers is important. And that's a greater thing than what she thinks. And the results of what you don't feel or see in the moment could actually be the greatest results that happen by far. So that was the commitment. Question number four, what action was taken? This is my favorite part of the story. I love it. I absolutely love this part of the story. And, and I love it because it's kind of your story and it's kind of my story. It's where Jesus reaches across the felt needs and he hits the real needs, right? Because here's what he does in the story. Jesus goes, hey, somebody touched me. And it's really funny, kind of. It's, it's comical because his disciples are going, like, what, are you kidding me? Like, for, I mean, everybody's touching you, Jer uh, Jesus. Everybody is pushing and not Jerry, Jesus. Everybody is, nobody's touching me right now. And that's a good thing. Sorry. All done? Okay. No, you're not all done. They're all pressing in against Jesus pushing him, shoving him, and he goes, somebody touch me. You know, that's a crazy statement when you consider the crowd, but it's not crazy if you understand Jesus and how he loves. Because Jesus always loves the individual. And he doesn't just love people in groups. He doesn't just love peoples and nations. He loves you. Just you. Exactly the way you are. And he loved her. And he could not just move on. He just couldn't do it. This woman had been healed in her body, but he knew that there was so much more that needed to happen than that. 
There were emotional and there were psychological scars that went so deep that they would never truly heal on their own, that they needed divine intervention from Jesus. And Jesus was up to the task of finishing the work. And that's why he said, somebody touched me. And he scans and he scans. And I can see this woman going, oh no. She's looking at this moment thinking this is the absolute worst. But it wasn't. It was the best. And finally, they make eye contact. And she knows she's outed. She knows that he knows. He finds her. She can't hide. And she comes up to him on her knees and reveals her secret to him. She lets Jesus have it. She lets Jesus have her preciously hidden secret. All of it. Something she's carried for 12 years. And when she relieves herself of that burden, Jesus looks at her and he says this word, this incredibly healing, wonderful word, He says, daughter. Do you know what he declares when he says that word? You belong. You matter. You're connected. Your family. What a picture of grace. These are the same exact things that we need, that you need, that the world around you needs, that people that are holding on to secrets and trying to put on fronts in front of other people and keeping the barriers up so that nobody sees who they really are. It's what everybody needs. And that's what this wreck the revision is all about. It's about reaching into people's lives and invading it with Jesus Christ and watch Jesus Christ do what only he can do. Reaching past your fell needs into those things that are truly real in your lives. Every day, we're surrounded by hundreds and thousands of secret bearers that need to know that Jesus has come and he has healing with him. A healing that goes beyond our ability to understand. The fact is, he's here right now. He's at every one of our locations right now for that healing. If you give him your secret, he will make you whole again. Only Jesus can do that. And the fifth question, what was the result? Well, we know that the result was complete healing. We could say physical healing, but it was more than that. It was emotional healing. It was psychological healing, spiritual healing. It was every kind of healing all wrapped into one because you know what? Jesus never does anything in pieces or parts. Because it's a reflection on him. Because when he does something, he looks at it and he goes, and it's good. He did that from when he created the universe. It was good. And what he did in this woman's life, it was good. You know what? I wonder if how many people are listening to me right now. Maybe you're online. Maybe you're inside. You're a .tv location or one of our locations And you let Jesus save you on the outside. Do you know what I mean by being saved on the outside? It means that maybe you came forward in church. Maybe you got baptized in the water. Maybe you became a member of the crossing or another church. And maybe you actually study your Bible and and you pray. But I'm asking you not about the outside. I'm asking you about what's going on inside. What about those bonds that are inside of you that nobody else will break and it's going to take a humbling, desperate effort on your part in the direction of Jesus to get there? In the book of Isaiah, in the Old Testament, chapter 64, it really describes how many of us might be feeling. It says, all of us have become like one who is unclean. Now remember, that word unclean in in the Hebrew, it's talking about just, not just physically, but spiritually. And all of our righteousness, that means the best of us, all of our righteous acts are like filthy, filthy rags. That term in the Hebrew language, that's, that is a PG term of an R term. That's actually talking about a woman's cycle. Are like filthy rags. That's the word in Hebrew. 
We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind, our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and made us waste away because of our sins. Isn't this described this woman? Isaiah 64, totally describing this woman. And that is so sad, it's so broken. But look what he does in verse eight and nine. Yet Lord, you are our father. Remember what he called her? Daughter, you're our father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, O Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. Oh, look upon us, we pray, for we're your people. And you see what Jesus does in this woman's life. You see the result. Why does that have to just be hers? Why can't that be ours? Has Jesus lost any of his power to do that? It could be your result today. This wreck the roof journey is all about taking risks for God. And it's really been encouraging to hear stories. And I've heard so many stories of people just like us, people in our number uh, that know people like this woman or that are in relation peop- relationships with people like this woman who are struggling and hurting and they, they have secrets And then they're going to God. There are people amongst us that are going to God saying, God, I want you to wreck my roof. I want you to do whatever it takes in my life to reach out to them. That's a pretty exciting thing to hear. I want you to hear the story of one family in Keokuk and how they've been challenged to be able to reach out and wreck the roof for Jesus Christ. It's a story of Ryan and Jenny Turner. Watch the video. My name's Jenny, and this is my husband, Ryan, and we are the Turners. We have two boys, Josh and Jack, and we're super excited about having been a part of The Crossing for four years. Four years. Our business has grown uh, north and west. It's grown away from our community. And for a while, we had the idea and the plan that it's, it's going to be time for us to move. We need to move. We need to uh, moved probably about 100 miles northwest, which would put us, you know, 200 miles from, from our church. And actually at men's conference this past summer, I felt God kind of convict me and say, I've brought you here to be a part of this. You're looking for your job to bring satisfaction, um, and then you're going to find a church, when the reality is you need to be connected to a church, and then from that I will provide everything you need. God really kind of gave us a heart for our own community, because we don't live in a specific community where there is a crossing location. We live in Burlington. And you can either look at your community and go, this place is dark, let's get out of here and go where there's life. Or you can be like, what if we could bring life to this community? And the crossing is the perfect vehicle for that. We are being challenged right now in the Wreck the Roof initiative because you can look back over your life and see where God has done incredible things. And for me, a lot of that time was when we were very young and first married and kind of walking through what it meant to to follow God and to trust Him in the first place. The question that I felt like I've been struggling with, that I've been convicted with is, did God stop doing really big, cool, amazing things, or have I stopped taking big, faith-filled risks? And so what I have to look back on personally and as a family, we have to ask, has God stopped doing really cool things over the years, or have we just kind of gotten comfortable in our mailing in our tithe check? You know what I mean? Not that that's not a, a good thing and something that's not worthy, um, of, you know, of, of sacrifice, but are, have we challenged ourselves in the area of our finances? And Wreck the Roof does a really good job of, of laying that out there without, without pushing you in any certain direction, but just kind, of, just kind of raising awareness of, hey, where are you trusting God in the area of your finances? And I know that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. What I really love about giving is it's an opportunity to measurably, tangibly walk out your relationship with God. We're asked to give, it's commanded of us to give, and it's a heart issue. It's not something I'm trying to do. It's not something I'm working towards. I'm either doing it or I'm not. And that dictates my heart, and it keeps my heart receptive to what God wants, and it doesn't allow me to have my life dictated by money 
or finance or stuff. Because at the end of the day, it's his anyway. And how are you going to show that? How are you going to show it? You show it by giving it. I'm really, really excited about what's next in our church because I feel like when you hear the goal of everybody involved in some way, shape, or form, I think of what it would look like if seven to 8,000 people decided on some level, I'm gonna be a part of this. Just take any random small group. What would that make a one small group look like if every small group member got involved? One entire campus, uh, you know, two campuses, three campuses, let alone an entire church. It doesn't wreck the roof, it, it, it tears it off. It gives us an opportunity uh, to reach people like we've never reached them before. This is it, we are the church. We're the only hope of the world. It's, the church is God's plan A, there's no plan B. That's, we're it. So either we're gonna get off our butts and do something, or we're just gonna be happy with where we're at. I would encourage people to give in this initiative because you have no idea what's next. You have no idea what's in store for everybody else, but you don't know how God's gonna change you through the whole process. So what's neat about an initiative like that is to take the opportunity to say, what are you gonna do, God, after I do this? Because I'm just excited to see what happens. The change of the heart, the change of our family, the change of a marriage, the change of your kids. And so in many ways, I think as shocking as this sounds, I think people should be thankful. I think every person in our congregation should be thankful that a church presents opportunities like this and gives us the chance to say, yeah, I think I want to be a part. Isn't that an awesome story to hear? You know, that, you know Burlington is just one of seven locations that we're looking at uh, going. And what's amazing about that is he's already done the work of raising up people around us that are saying, here am I, send me. I want to be a part of that. I want to go there. I, I, I want to make a difference because how many people with secrets are there in Burlington and how many are there in the other locations that we're planning on going to, that we were planning to, to impact and invade for Jesus Christ. And, and then we have to ask ourselves, what's, what's my part of this? Well, that's why this thing is in front of you. That's why we're praying about it, because how do we band together? There are so many different ways we can do that. This is one way everybody can do it. God may be calling you to something even more, like he's doing with the Turners, but he may be calling you to this, and we need to be praying and listening to what God has to say to us. You know what I love about all the things they said? The thing that hit me the best was it's not going to just wreck the roof. It's going to tear the whole thing off. And that's what can happen when Christians get together and they are like-minded and they have one vision and they move forward together. Because that's what it takes to reach people like the woman that we learned about today. That's what it takes to reach people on the streets or people just like you and me. We're moving to a time of decision. <coughs> We've all got secrets like the lady in this story. It's the secret place deep down inside in our heart of hearts that no one else has access to. It's where we keep things locked up, bottled up. We leave it down there and we throw away the key. We build walls around other people so that they can't ever find out. We make up lies to tell everyone, trying to build this imaginary world so that they think that we live in it. But when it comes to God, all of that changes. Hebrews 4.12 says that the Word of God judges the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. It breaks down the walls, it unlocks all the doors, and it shines a light on all that we have hidden. The real question to ask yourself today is, are you going to accept it? Are you going to accept that God knows what you're dealing with? That He knows how to help you? and that he will always be with you as you battle whatever dark secrets you have? Or are you gonna stay pretending, hiding from a God that sees everything? I'll be here throughout the rest of service and I'd love to pray with you as you make that choice. I wanna see God wreck the roof of your life, but you've gotta make the first swing. Let's do that right now. Thank you. 
When Jesus died on the cross, the disciples had to make a choice. Were they going to commit to the teachings of Jesus or were they going to run and hide? The commitment that they made in those few moments changed the entire planet for all of history. They did so because of what Jesus sacrificed himself for, you and me. So let's spend some moments together remembering that sacrifice and dreaming about what our commitment to Jesus could look like. Thank you so much for joining with us today. If you have any questions, you can get in touch with me by emailing joeyh at thecrossing.net for any questions or just to continue the conversation. Also, make sure to hit the give button at the top of the screen or you can text the crossing online to 77977 to give right from your phone. Thanks for coming and I'll see you next week.